Hey church family, I want to ask you a question. What comes to mind when you think of someone who is very worshipful? What images pop into your thinking? Maybe someone who does their morning devotions in the original Greek or Hebrew, probably by candlelight, if we're being honest. Or perhaps it's someone who has daily six-hour prayer times, has never uttered a word stronger than shoot in their whole life. Perhaps you picture someone who drives with their knees so that they can keep their hands raised to the new Bethel album even while they're in the car. Or maybe you think of a, a nun or a monk in a nearly silent monastery or convent or an ascetic who is living in isolation on top of a pole in the desert, which was a thing for a while. Well, I want to say that none of those things are bad in and of themselves, except for driving with your knees. Don't do that. Other than that, none of those things are bad in and of themselves, but perhaps surprisingly, the Bible's picture of authentic worship, well, it bears really little resemblance to the kind of devotional activities that we often imagine. This past Sunday, we took a look at Isaiah 58 and the call for God's people to inhabit their identity in ways that led to justice, wholeness, and healing for the broken places of the world. And in that passage, God went so far as to call his people's religious devotion perfunctory. You might remember that was our vocab word for the sermon. He called it empty and worthless due to their lack of concern and compassion for the oppressed. And I mentioned in that teaching that this is actually a prominent theme in the scripture, but that we didn't have time to get into it there. So for the next few minutes, I want to walk us through a number of relevant passages that support that claim. So from the outset, let's just suffice to say that God's concern in Isaiah 58, it's not a one-time burst of compassion for the oppressed. The theme of God's heart for the marginalized is really evident in all of Scripture. It's evident in the Old Testament, in the Mosaic Law, the wisdom literature, and the prophets. In the New Testament, a similar theme can be found in the Gospels and the letters to the earliest Christian communities. Yet, while it's one thing for God to assert his own heart for the poor and oppressed, what about the claim that we considered from Isaiah 58 that worship is uniquely expressed in pursuing justice, wholeness, and healing for the suffering? I want to help us take a look at just a few scriptures that develop that idea. And let's start with a voice that ought to sound pretty familiar by now, the prophet Isaiah. You may remember that the structure of Isaiah is like a case being presented in a court of law. Well, the opening argument, as it were, in chapter 1 sounds like this. Hear the words that God has for his people. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Now, it's a pretty strong rebuke of their worship practices, but notice what comes next in that text. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. God declares that his disdain for the meaningless offerings of his people is prompted by their way of light apart from the worship gathering. God's call to them is not to find better worship practices. He doesn't say, get better offerings to bring to me. No. He says, you need to live lives of faithfulness that give credence to your worship practices. And now a similar theme is on display in the prophet Amos. He was writing in the ninth century 
during the time of the divided kingdom, and his message is addressed primarily to the northern kingdom of Israel. Notice that through him, God has a familiar message for those who claim to worship him. In Amos chapter 5, God says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never-failing stream. As in Isaiah chapter 1 and Isaiah 58, the Lord calls his people in Amos 5 to put an end to empty worship if it isn't also accompanied by heart's intent on pursuing justice, wholeness, and healing. Now, the image in verse 24 of a powerful flood of righteousness overtaking the land, it might not be familiar to us, but for the original hearer, it would have brought to mind the image of a wadi. Now, a wadi was a riverbed that would be dry for much of the year, but could quickly become swollen and filled during the rainy season. And a rushing wadi had the power to transform a surrounding area from arid to flourishing. Now, through Amos, God pictures his people as a source of flourishing, not because of their noisy worship, but because of their commitment to justice and righteousness. Now, I've got one last prophetic passage for us to look at, this time from the post-exilic prophet Zechariah. You may remember that after the southern kingdom of Judah was conquered by Babylon, the people were taken away into exile, and decades later, a remnant was allowed to return to Jerusalem. Yet it seems that even the experience of exile, it didn't sufficiently cure the people of God from hearts that were tempted toward perfunctory worship. Hear these words from Zechariah chapter 7. The people of Bethel had sent Sherezer and Regem Melech together with their men to entreat the Lord by asking the priests of the house of the Lord Almighty and the prophets, should I mourn and fast in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? Then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. Ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seven months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? Are not these the words the Lord proclaimed through the earlier prophets when Jerusalem and its surrounding towns were at rest and prosperous and the Negev and the western foothills were settled? And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. The people asked the Lord, in essence, now that we've been restored to the land, now that our time of exile is over, should we worship as we did in the exile with fasting and mourning? Now, as we considered on Sunday, fasting is almost always treated as intense religious devotion. Yet notice that the Lord's response to his people, it dismisses the expected worship categories that they give and instead calls for them to live lives of integrated faithfulness that demonstrated concern for the marginalized and the vulnerable. Throughout the prophets, in particular, God offers a repeated message to his people to not put trust in worship forms if they were unwilling to align their hearts with his. Now, one could say at this point, sure, Benji, that's fine, but that's all Old Testament stuff. Don't we live under a different covenant now? Yes. Yes, we do. Yet there is a surprising amount of continuity of emphasis on this theme in the Old Testament as well, and the New Testament, excuse me. From the concern shown for the inequity of the food distribution along ethnic lines that takes place in Acts chapter 6 to James 127's combination of personal piety and social engagement that we looked at this past Sunday, the New Testament does not shy away from continuing to call God's people to live out lives that show that their identity drives them to pursue justice, wholeness, and healing for the world. Perhaps most significantly, the words of Jesus himself paint a picture of the high stakes of this calling. Looking forward to the end of time, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, when the Son of Man, I'm sorry, Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit 
on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Not what we might expect, certainly, but Jesus offers a vision of saving faith that is manifested by addressing injustice in the world. Now, to be clear, Jesus is not saying that these acts save the people he calls his sheep. No, he's not saying that. What he is saying is that such acts are the obvious outcome of a life that has known the saving power of Jesus. It is notable that those welcomed into the kingdom did not themselves point to the work as salvific. They didn't even realize they were doing it. No, the point of Jesus' illustration is not that the work saves, but that the saved do the work of the kingdom of God. Friends, I hope this quick tour of just some of the relevant scriptures has proven helpful to demonstrate that hearts of worshipful people are revealed in hearts for vulnerable people. I know that for some of us, this represents a bit of a shift of thinking of how we've been taught to think about worship and maybe even the spiritual life. But as those who belong to Jesus, this should not come as much of a surprise. After all, as we read in Colossians 1, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. As we marry our worship with a way of life that seems to, seeks to bring justice and wholeness and healing to the broken places of the world, we are simply offering ourselves as instruments in the hands of the one who lived and gave his life to reconcile not only things in heaven, but things on earth as well. Church, bless you as you seek to inhabit your identity in every realm of your life.